Welcome to Strictly Salina. I'm Brenda Gutierrez with the Salina Area United Way, and with me today on Strictly Salina, we have Jared Morris from, well, a couple of hats, but Rolling yeah. Hills from the zoo, and he's brought something to share with us today. We want to find out a little bit about um, how you got mm -hmm. to where you are, what you're doing now, and then also a little bit later in the show, tell us about what we have in front of us. Um, yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I think when uh, when we talked the other day, we were kind of talking about pollinators and what's going on in the gardens this time of year and, and maybe at Rolling Hills Zoo. Uh -huh. um, so uh, pollinators is something that we take um, a lot of pride in, things we uh, are, uh, um, um, you know, just projects that we really try to keep in, uh, in, our, in our thoughts all the time as we're working on um, different projects or sprucing, sprucing gardens up. Um, the reason pollinators are really important is um, I think everybody knows that pollinators um, you know, they, they go out flying flower to flower, gathering nectar and, and pollen and distributing it, and that's um, a big uh, help or a big reason on why plants can, can propagate. Um, so when we are designing gardens, we're thinking about native plants, plants that will help native populations around us. Um, one thing that's really important to us is the mark, butterfly. Now, um, I think we know um, or have been aware that monarchs are really unique as they come through here because not only are they a pollinator that will visit many different flowers, gathering pollen and, and sharing it around, but they will only lay their eggs on a milkweed plant. It's the only one they'll, they'll lay on. And the reason why it's important that we know that and understand that is we're losing a lot of our grasslands or native lands to um, uh, development, um, maybe some agriculture, uh, just all the things that we have going on around. So it's important where we can as citizens to maybe help supplement some, some milkweeds. Well, several times you're going to be talking about weeds as a good thing. So mm -hmm. we want you to notice that um, the natural landscape and the milkweed, it, it's a friend to, um, you know, the long, not just like this year, next year, the year after, to have those gardens and have that. And when you think about it at the zoo, how big, like acres, how, how much are you taking care of the gardens right. and the landscaping out there? So the whole entire zoo, the entirety of the zoo property sits on 165 acres. Okay. And when you come visit the zoo, you're visiting 65 acres of that. So we have so much more property around us. And, um, you know, some of that behind the scenes stuff serves um, the main barn, which is um, the main place the keepers work out of, the commissaries down there, um, you know, their break room. They can house some animals, education animals down there. And then the maintenance and landscape, they have a shop um, outside of the um, main part of the zoo where we keep all of our equipment stuff, and the veterinarian hospital is also outside of that. Um, but then the rest of it is grassland. And um, we want to really take care of that grassland the best we can, and so we're always kind of trying to figure out what is the best thing we can do. It used to get mowed real regularly, which um, that helped keep down the cedar trees or the other um, invasive tree species that, that we have in the area. Um, in the last several years, it hasn't been able, we didn't have really the opportunity to mow it a lot. Um, one year we did have the chance to burn it, um, but we need to get back onto a good practice of that. And the reason that's important to keep those invasive species out of there, including those cedar trees, is so that the milkweeds um, can flourish in that area. Um, now the common milkweed, which is the ones that you'll really find um, prevalent out in the prairie or the grasslands, um, will colonize. So, you know, you, you get a plant just over the years, they'll, they'll keep building into a, a good, healthy population. And those butterflies that are migrating through need need that. And, and so we when want they, those butterflies to come through. And we want through. those butterflies, because the monarch is, is really a unique species. Um, if I am saying this correctly, which I, I, I think I'm either saying it correctly or really close, is that the mon there's no other species of, mon of butterfly that will migrate like they do. Because they start their spring in Mexico, and they slowly start moving north through North America. And they just, it's just generation after generation, and the further they go, more generations. And they'll make it up near Canada. Wow. And then there's a time, you know, they, they know when the time is, whether it's by sunlight or, or what, they know that it's time to go home. 
so then they'll start coming back and um, that's when people are seeing those big um, mass numbers of, of butterflies coming through. Maybe if you um, live out in the county, your hedgerows, you might find one evening just filled with, with monarchs. Well, they're moving their way back to Mexico where they will overwinter and then they'll live there and as soon as they start again, they start laying eggs on milkweed and then um, that generation dies and they just keep building. And like I said, it's really unique since they will only lay eggs and the, the caterpillars will only eat um, the milkweed. So it's really important that we have that. So thinking about, Salina so talks a lot about we're in the heartland. Mm -hmm. We talk about chambers and tourists. To be friendly to the, to the insects too is what I'm <laughs> yeah, hearing. Right. Because we want not only the humans, but to have all, all the different, uh, the cycle of nature to come and go through that. Right. And I'm thinking about people that live in town. What can they do to help welcome? Uh, so there's so many things you or, can do. Or not do, maybe. Or not do. Yeah, well, it's probably easier to say things to not do because um, it, it might be one of those things that, um, you know, if you just, so let, let's do the not do first. Okay. Um, first thing, let's just pay attention to what we're doing to the environment, right? Um, Willy-nilly using pesticides and herbicides, you know, you have have a, a single pest that you you want to go after and you just think, the more spray I spray, the better, or I'm gonna eliminate, you know, I want all the wasp out of my yard. Well, if you just broadly spray, you're killing Oh, lots everything. of things are gonna pass. So yes. if you do have that yeah. one particular pest that you need, understand how you can control that one pest, like the wasp nest, for example. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you have a, a termite problem. Understand how you're gonna deal with that problem without disrupting the entire um, environment around you. So that's one good thing. Um, you know, one thing to do or to not do. Um, other things you can do, if you say you, you're in an apartment complex and you just have a balcony, just a simple um, um, planter box oh, yeah. with some of everybody's favorite plants. Like, yeah, um, um, lantana mm -hmm. is real popular among pollinators. Uh, zinnias, I think, are real popular. Um, you, 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 yeah, the burst of color that people like to see. Right. Those, those are all, you know, beneficial um, to that. So that's one thing you can do if you're in a smaller space. Now, if, if you rent a home or own your home, you can start incorporating um, bigger pollinator gardens into your, into your lawn, your landscape. Um, eliminate some of that lawn. I mean... Grass is nice, but... It, it, you know, <laughs> here's the thing. The gra grass looks nice, and I... <laughs> Um, recently moved into a neighborhood where everybody loves their grass <laughs> and I'm going to maintain my grass responsibly you know so it looks good for the neighborhood but I'm also eliminating a lot of it and we're gonna bring more plants in um, this is more like a demonstration oh, garden right yeah I mean who wants to gradually uh, I mean, this is this can be done it's just it's, I think it's weird how we water and water water grass just so we can go mow it you know? <laughs> <laughs> you and I have other things we could be doing. Well, right? I would rather do anything but mow grass. What can we be doing? Yes. Well, and, oh. and also um, thinking about the water. Water, fresh water, is important if we're going to have uh, keeping the pollinators. Uh, you know, you've got the insects. You want yeah. to come. You want them to stay healthy. So having fresh, clean water is yeah, going to be and, important. And that's as easy as because they're not picky. Yeah. That's not picky at all. So one thing that we do a lot of is mulch, like real thick mulch everywhere. Which mulch is very beneficial and. There's so many different types of mulches, you know, whether it's just the natural leaf, leaf breakdown, leaf mulch, you know, um, compost, you're composting some of that. But insects need some of that bare soil. Because if you're out watering, watering your garden, and there's all that mulch there, and they can't get to some of that soil, like butterflies, for example, they can drink just fine off wet soil or a, a muddy, uh, like, like a mud hole or something. And many of them can. So. <clears throat> As you're designing your garden, think about um, spots that you can leave so that the, you know, maybe if your drip irrigation is running in your garden, a spot that they can get in there and get that, get yeah. that water. Purposeful, a little spot, it's a good thing. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's like we, a few years ago at the zoo, uh, we started thinking, trying to think, um, how, can we, how can we eliminate some of the work? And we have so much grass out there. So we played around some ideas of letting some grass just grow kind of more natural and it was it was controlled you know we made sure that there was no noxious weeds in there 
Uh, we made sure that it could get some water so it didn't look just like a browned up yeah, area that did, is just yeah. not getting taken care of. Uh -huh. And a, a phrase that kind of came out of that was, um, j as long as it looks intentional or looks on purpose, you know, so we still mowed around it. We still put a little bit of water on it. We made it look on purpose. So you're, you're exactly right when you said a little bit of intention like that is, um, is, is huge. So. And what brought you to this? I can tell by the way you're explaining and the details that you're sharing. What yeah. brought you to this interest in, in the insects, the pollinators, and the, and the landscape? You know, I think this all started back when I was a kid. So my dad uh, was in the military, and so we moved around a lot. But when we were um, stationed in California, we were not very far from Yosemite National Park. And so we would camp in the mountains around Yosemite a lot. And so we spent a lot of time outside in the mountains, um, exploring creeks, um, seeing a lot of wildlife out there. Um, thankfully, never encountered a bear where we shouldn't have. <clears throat> but that was just always something that I've just always been outside. Mm -hmm. Um, when I left to go to college, I originally went for design, graphic design, because um, I wouldn't call myself an artist, but I like to draw, design, create. You enjoy. Always enjoying creating stuff. But once I got to college, it wasn't long after that, some people I became friends with were there studying plants. Mm. And probably when I should have been doing some of my own homework, I was going with them to the park okay. to identify plants, mm -hmm. or there were... Um, fields around the college that we would go in and identify grasses mm -hmm. and all that. And I just ended up enjoying more time being with the plants than anything else. And then um, I discovered that, well, design, my love of design, also fits into landscape, too, because you're designing stuff. So um, I've just always enjoyed solving problems around people's landscape, um, around the zoo's landscape. Um, just, and I always enjoy helping people yeah. too. So. Well, the variety of sizes between your own lawn and at the zoo, you've got a, a variety of experiences there. Right. How about, how are you incorporating um, the at the zoo? Tell us a little bit about what someone would see. If they want to know more about specifically pollinators at the zoo, what might they see? Yeah, so we were really fortunate. Um, several years ago, we applied for a grant through uh, the Association of Zoological Horticulture. And through them, we were able to purchase um, some native plants. Mm. Uh, so we have two or three gardens set up. Um, one, of, one of the bigger garden sets between the giraffe exhibit and the African crown crane exhibit. And you can actually walk off the pathway and, and onto a graveled area and get up close with the plants. Uh, right now, um, the bee balm is blooming and it looks amazing. Um, the uh, cone flowers, we have some, um, some yellow cone, some prairie cone flower, um, purples. Um, I think we have some white cone flower there blooming as well. Um, I'm, I'm also, the aroma is going through my mind, too. Yeah. When you're walking out in nature, when you have the aroma of yeah. the, the natural blooming flowers. Yeah. And, and, then, um, and then not too far from there, we have, um, since you brought up the aroma, we have some uh, lavender that's oh. blooming now, too. And uh, the lavender is just amazing. Yeah. Um, and, and then, of course, mixed in there, we have the common milkweed. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that's probably uh, three feet tall. It's uh, just finishing blooming now. So uh, the flowers are starting to wilt, and then here real soon we'll, the seed pods will, will be forming. Mm -hmm. And that's also amazing too. And uh, it's really fun to collect those seed pods in about February. And uh, um, you just make sure that you open them wisely and outside <laughs> because um, they have been known to burst and, and just float. <laughs> not in your house if your parents are not approving. That's, right. that's part of what we're saying. There's a, there's a story from the Monarch Watch, and they, they asked for people to send them. So, oh. But there's instructions on how oh. to separate. Uh, for, for people who don't know the pods, when they, when they, they slowly will open, yeah. and then each seed is attached to uh, like a silky-like um, parachute. I guess, you yeah, know. Yeah, because it's not really a vein. But right, yes. yeah. So as soon as it opens, the wind will just start, it'll start <laughs> lifting off there and floating away so it can disperse, right? Well, they, the reason they want you to be real careful, somebody packed a whole bunch of pods into a box and sent it, and they opened it and ripped it open, and it just oh. <laughs> seed 
seed pods floating everywhere. So, so caution to some of the things. <laughs> right. Explore with caution. Explore, um, yeah, under, under reasonable circumstances of things like that. Oh right. my goodness. Yeah. So, and then, um, um, oh and then we have, you know, we have a sign up there that because um, we are also um, labeled as a Monarch Way Station, mm. and then things that come with that is we are um, real um, cautious about how we use chemicals, and. I've had many people come by and say, you see, your bindweed is getting out of control. <laughs> it's true, but it's also blooming right now, so I'm not going to go spray, you know, spray an herbicide on, on something that the bees and, and other insects are visiting right now. Yeah. Um, so we always try to be cautious about that. Um, insecticides, um, sometimes it's easier for us in those gardens, instead of spraying our gardens, you know, if you just take your shears and go cut the plant off, if, if there's something on it, dispose of that and that perennial will just pop right back up again so um, don't have to use chemicals you don't have to you don't have Good to use fashion, you get, if you need to pull something after yep. it's bloomed yeah well, you mentioned bees mm -hmm. what what's in front of us this has to we'll transition to bees yeah so talking. this so this is exciting <laughs> because with you. about um so i'm also uh take part in the um master gardener program in the area and a few years ago uh, maybe four years ago, there was a, um, a field day in Johnson County, kind of an advanced training type of thing. And um, so there was all these different demo plots everywhere. But at the end of many rows were beehives. And I thought, man, that's kind of cool. But when we were having our snacks and our coffee and stuff, people were just standing there right next to them. You know, some people setting their Gatorade bottle right on the, oh, the, on the, the hot. On the hot. And, mm. and I asked somebody about that. And they're like, ah, no, they don't care. Just don't kick them, you know? Oh. And so then I started really thinking about, man, you know, it'd be cool to bring bees to the zoo. People would like that. And then I've been fortunate enough through the zoo to be able to travel to the uh, Association of Zoological Horticulture Conference every year. And I've been noticing that more and more zoos are bringing bees actually into the zoo uh, for demo purposes to see. And um, I thought, you know what? I, I think it's time. So then, through the association again, I applied for a uh, conservation or a, a Wendy Andrew cultivation grant, and we got that grant, and that helped pay for our first three beehives, including the bees. So if you walk down to uh, the reptile building, you'll see uh, right off the into the lawn there behind the people barrier, we have we actually have four hives right now, and um, they've been going. A couple of them been going strong for a couple years now. Now this summer is weird because we're not having a good honey buildup this year. Um, bees don't collect a lot of nectar when it's rainy, real rainy and real wet because they're usually inside. And then we turn it off to get really hot. And a defense mechanism for plants is to kind of pull that nectar back down as a kind of a survival mode. Uh -huh. So we're not getting as much, pol or an, as much nectar out, so they're not making as much honey right now. Um, but at least the hives are, are doing well. Um, so that's what our main focus right now is just to keep the bees, the bees healthy. Um, so you could have up to 30, 40, 50,000 bees in a hive, depending on how you're building. Uh, they start, um, the queen will start laying eggs end of January, beginning of February. They'll start that build up. On those nice days, they'll go out, start looking for pollen. Um, oftentimes, cottonwood trees are one of the first ones to, to start. Um, I think uh, willow trees are also an early plant that they can harvest some pollen from. Um, once they have their, their honey store or their brood box with supplies in it and the queen's laying, once they get all that full, you can start putting honey supers on and then all their excess they'll start putting up in those boxes and then that's what a beekeeper would harvest. Um, so this is um, one layer. One so Right, so this is okay. one layer what we're looking at. And when this, you talked about building up. Yep, and so, so this be, is uh, a honey super here. So this is what they will create the honey in. Now the brood boxes that set below it look identical to this. They're just deeper. Oh. Okay. So um, if I can, I'll pull um, I'll pull a frame out here. And then uh, this is what a typical newer frame looks like. It's a wood frame and it's got a, a plastic foundation in there. And there is some um, a light wax coating rolled over this. And that just helps the bees understand that they can go in there and start building. So they will build their comb off of this. And like I said, if this were in the brood box where she would be laying eggs, this is, would be a taller frame. And then so they would, she would lay eggs primarily in the middle. And then they would um, supply pollen and honey around that. So 
um, almost all the bees in the beehive are all girls. And uh, the bees that will stay on these frames and help raise them are, are the nurse bees. And then once the nurse bees have done that for a while and new bees come along, they then go out and become the forager bees. And the new bees that are emerging then take over as the, the nurse bees for a while. So basically, uh, the queen comes in, lays an egg. It's an egg for about three days. And then um, the egg will hatch and become a larva. And then um, depending on what the bee's going to be, it'll be a larva for several days. It'll grow. The nurse bees will continue to feed it. And then after a time period, the bees will cap that. And then that larva will pupate and then later emerge as a, as a bee. So that's really cool. So, what, um, so since this is a honey super, they would draw the comb out on this. And they will bring the nectar in. And they will um, fill it with nectar. And then as it ripens, they will cap it and Ooh. produce something that looks similar to this. Um, honey could look different depending on what they're, uh, what they're pulling nectar from at the time. Um, usually about, um, um, I think a lot of honey harvesting gets done in, in about July. Um, there's a lot of other maintenance that goes into keeping bees and keeping bees healthy. So we want to get them through the honey, um, the honey flow safely, let them build up everything they need. And then um, as fall approaches, the queen knows that she needs to start getting ready for um, winter time. So she stops laying as many eggs so that it opens up more cells available so that they can store more honey. So a, a beekeeper will want to pull, start pulling honey supers off to force them to, to fill the brood box, and the brood box will be where they would overwinter. Um, but we have a problem with insects that get in there, uh, and a particular mite is a problem, a varroa mite, and they're really bad for your hives. And so beekeepers can treat for them in August when the honey supers are off. So um, honey harvest is usually wrapping up about then, and then we start treating and getting our bees ready for, um, for winter at that time. So a beekeeper would take something like this, and depending on how big of operation you have, um, you could probably have a simple little hand crank separator, so you would peel this wax off, put it in, use a centripetal force to, to pull the honey out of it. The cells and wax will be left over, and you can just put this back out in your bee yard. They'll clean it all up, get it ready, for, uh, get it ready to go again, and you can store it, give it back to them next spring. So at the zoo, what do they do with the honey? So um, what we would like to do when we, can, um, when we get enough to harvest to, to put out, we would like to start selling some of it in our gift shop. Oh, nice. So our uh, uh, graphics design um, uh, person out at the zoo uh, actually designed a really good looking label. And, uh -huh. and we did bottle a few um, to see what they would look like. And they're going to look good. And I think it's going to be a real popular item when when we get there. Well, no, and especially if people get to see, okay, mm -hmm. this is where this came from, we get to see this in action. Do you um, perceive that you'll be adding any more boxes, or are you at a good point with balancing everything else and all the rest of the responsibilities? Right, so with, the, so with everything I have to do, I didn't intend to, to go to four boxes, but it, it kind of just happened. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I keep bees myself also out of my folks' farm. And uh, uh, when your population is really exploding um, inside these hives, the queen will do something that's really interesting. If the hive gets too many bees in it, she knows that maybe we need to split off because we're out of room. So she'll start signaling to the other bees, hey, we're going to have to swarm or we're going to have to move. So they'll build some extra queen cells in there. She'll intentionally lay eggs to become queens. And then right before they hatch, she'll tell half the bees in there, hey, we're leaving. And they will gorge themselves on some pollen mm -hmm. and some, um, some nectar. And then when the time's right, she's like, we're out of here, and they'll go. And then that's what people see on swarms. Everybody has seen those photographs or the um, images on, on your social media of cars or motorcycles that have bees hanging off of uh -huh. them, or somebody's doors got trees bees hanging on trees. And, uh -huh. and that's um, what that is. And that's what that is. That was a, a, a hive somewhere, a colony somewhere, got too big, and the queen took half of them. Basically, what happens is they go out, and some scout bees go out and find a new location. As soon as it's, something's located, they come back and tell them, and then they fly again and go. So if you see a swarm, uh, there's a few things you can do. Um, 
I think, if I understand right, um, there's a list of beekeepers at the animal shelter that they'll pass on numbers to. I think the Santa Police Department also keeps a list. So um, you can call them, they'll give you some numbers. You can call people that might be interested in, in coming and getting them for you. But also if you just leave them, within a few hours they're probably gonna fly away anyways. If it's close to night, they'll probably spend the night there, but they'll, they'll be gone, they'll go somewhere and, and um, you probably won't see them. Leave, leave them alone. They know what they're doing. They know what they, they know exactly what they're what doing. Yes. <laughs> right. So. Oh my gosh! Yeah, all the different things. Well, um, having um, another. If you would explain what else you brought, this is a smoker. Yeah. Is so this right? is this is a smoker, and um, I, I brought it because um, a smoker is also one of those beekeeping tools that everybody kind of recognizes, mm -hmm. right? And so bees communicate all through the the hive with um, just pheromones. So, you know, the, the queen can tell them what to do by producing different pheromones, you know. Um, when a per beekeeper goes in there and uh, they start getting all riled up, you know, they communicate with each other. Well, the smoke will kind of help camouflage that a little bit. It kind of, kind of, I, th I think it's, it kind of sticks to their receptors and, and, and so basically helps keep them calm. Mm -hmm. So maybe bees in a, a, a lower box don't go on high alert. Mm -hmm. And this time of the year, if you get in a hive, you move gentle, slow, you're not kicking it, you're not dropping stuff, they're usually pretty calm. They, they, they don't really mind you being in there. Um, like I said, though, if you take a hive and you, or a, a frame and you drop it on the ground, they'll get very upset. <laughs> um, but if you just work real slow, in and out, um, uh, again, working with intention, um, they usually don't mind. Now, if it's overcast, if it's evening, if it's cooler outside, and they don't have as much work to do, they're a little bit less um, tolerable of, of you being in their hive. Oh, so okay. um, usually when it's hot out, they're too busy to care most uh -huh. of the time. So, um, But yeah, uh, smoke is, is something that's um, a bee, been a beekeeper's friend forever. Beekeepers used to just light a pipe and, and just let the smoke you know, just always be around. Um, Start using smokers. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it really seems to, to help. Yeah. And if people, um, are there scheduled, uh, I don't know, like tours or scheduled times that you give demonstrations mm -hmm. right now at the zoo? There's before? not right now, but I, went, I would really like to get into that. Um, uh, with everything just always being crazy all the time. Was, There's a lot going on at the zoo. So <laughs> I, I try and, and don't write this down and don't come out specifically for this, but I usually try to make Tuesday mornings around 9-ish when I go out there. Do so, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't always work, but... That's <laughs> yeah. Well, some of the other things that are going on in July, in, a, in addition to Tuesday with the bees, mm -hmm. uh, you've got some special events if people want to check their calendars. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, probably one of the um, more popular events we just had, the oh. Father's Day Car Show, oh, which yes. um, if you haven't been out for a, a few years, it, it's changed a little bit to where it's an evening event now. Um, it's it's uh, so, so much fun. Um, the turnout was great, and I... I, I don't have the numbers off yet on, on what we did, but, but it was great. Um, another set of events that happens throughout the summer, which is really fun, is the Safari Breakfast. And it's so popular, but it sells out almost immediately. So if, um, if, if the idea of getting up early, getting to the zoo early, having a good breakfast amongst the animals, um, and they're always themed, so it would be like maybe at giraffes or at chimps or, or at tigers or something. Uh, but they set up uh, tables around, and they'll, they'll serve a meal, uh, a breakfast. And then uh, I think oftentimes the keepers will do a little talk about it and oftentimes let the animals out so you can be there for that. And that all happens before the zoo opens. Um, but like I said, they're all sold out this year. Um, so uh, be thinking about it for next year. Be watching the calendar. July 31st is our next big event, and to me, it's probably my most favorite event, and it's Zoo Brew. And uh, uh, so basically, it's um, a craft brew type sampling type thing. Um, and I, I have it written down here. I think um, for members, it's like $35. For non-members, it's $40. Um, and if you're a designated driver, your ticket's only $20. So you, you, get, you get a discount to be the designated driver. Um, but there's uh, all sorts of great food they serve, live music, and then um, you get a sample, unlimited samples of the craft brews that are all set up. Um, and so they set up the tents on the big lawn in front of the restaurant. Um, it's from 6 p.m. till 10 p.m. and it's a load of fun. Yeah. Well, there's a lot happening at the zoo. Yeah, there's, oh. there's always something good going on. Oh, this is great. Well, and, and new, um, this is a fairly new project, mm -hmm. so sometimes things 
go away or are a little less and mm -hmm. other things pop up and uh, mm -hmm. we kind of watch our calendar our news uh, uh, realizing there's a loss of some animals yeah. and then there are new animals that come in right. so um, the, the ups and the downs of the emotions for that well I thank you so much for yeah. bringing I'm glad you could bring this Absolutely. today and tell us some of the things that are going on and getting to know a little bit about you how you came about this landscape yeah. and the design now we know a little bit more yeah. about that well thank you for joining us on Strictly Salina Absolutely. we're glad you could come I'm Brenda with the Salina United Way and thank you for joining us.